Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to my studio. I'm Jesse, and this is the Knit Up and Die podcast, and we're live today, which is fairly different, and um, it's a little bit scary. Hopefully, you guys can all hear me. Uh, they've changed the software around a lot, so I'm on a steep learning curve today, but we're going to do the best we can. Can everybody hear me? Somebody just say, hey, I can hear you so I can be sure it's working properly. Anybody? I hope so. I hope it's working. <laughs> Nobody's responding at all. I have no idea. I'm hoping that this is streaming properly. Yay. All right, Glenda, thank you so much. So good to see all of you. I can't believe how many of you have joined me. Thank you. That is super cool. I really, really messed up. Um, when I announced the live last time, I gave you all horrible wrong time zones. The only time zone I got right was my own. <laughs> and I, I know better. I should have been able to see better. And I don't know what was happening in my head, but I really messed that up. So let's, let's, Let's have a podcast, shall we? As always, I'm going to start with my thank yous. Hello to everybody joining me. Um, special hello and thanks go out to Joy, Monica, Nancy, Rachel, Leanne, Brenda, Faye, Mary, Marie, David, Donna, Amy, Tara, Diane, Allison, Barbara, Adriana, Wayne, Patricia, Lisa, Lette, Jorge, Kath, Benty, Christy, Nietzsche, Charlotte, Roseanne, Linda, Marie, Betty Ann, Scott, John, Jennifer, Heather, Kate, Terry, and Janet. As always, a much love goes out to my Zoom family, Robert, Juanita, Paula, Brian, Katie, Eve, Jamie, Jen, Elizabeth, Shirley, Roz, and Nicole. Thank you, guys. And as always, many, many thanks go out to my patrons. You make this happen, whether it's the lighting that I have or the camera that I have. Um, you're supporting this and making a reality for me and for you. Thank you. This is going to be really, really messy because I don't get to edit. <laughs> um, I'm used to having that safety net in place. I it, We haven't done a live episode in a while, a while. And so please pardon me. I've had a little bit of a throat thing today. And so I'm trying very hard not to cough. And if I go into a coughing jag, I'm not going to be able to edit. <laughs> but we're going to do what we can. I uh, have a lot going on. I have a lot going on. As I've been talking about to you guys for several weeks now, my company, my day job is moving, and that's actually happening right now. Theoretically, my box of work is being delivered to my desk right now. Um, hopefully, hopefully my tote didn't get lost. Hopefully nothing in it is damaged. Um, the weather's been good, so I know it's not soaked from rain. Thank goodness. Um, and it, it's going to be this whole new crazy environment because not only has my desk changed, not only has the address changed, the building changed, but a bunch of our processes have changed as well. We'll be working with new technology, new computers, and I have like first aid jitters. It's really weird um, after having worked with the company some seven years now to be nervous about going into the office. Seven years, six years, something like that. I don't even remember. It's been a while. So um, I, I'm excited to go and get this move over with. I'm excited to settle into the new space. I'm excited to have a nice, clean, healthy building and, and not be in a actual hospital setting anymore. Hospital settings can be very, very difficult. I saw ambulances all the time. I saw life fights all the time. I have often ended up helping people down in the lobby that were sick or injured or scared or lost. And we're going to be now just a private practice. And that takes a lot of pressure off in a lot of ways um, in that it's just us. It's not us in another professional environment. So um, there, there's not as much keeping face being a representative of the company, I'm much more hidden than I used to be. And I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, I mean, I, as much as you see this here, I actually don't like being on stage. Um, so not having that environment, is it's going to be nice. I'm, I'm excited about that. That's life. That's where we are right now. Um, 
weather is starting finally to get a little bit better here. I'm not as cold all the time, which is nice. But oddly enough, I'm looking at some new projects to work on. And one of the projects that I'm leaning towards <laughs> is a big hooded cowl piece um, made out of probably a bulky weight yarn. I want something super, super warm now that I don't need it. <laughs> That's the perfect time to make it, right? Um, also, I am looking at perhaps knitting a lace weight stole. I I saw a pattern in Piecework Magazine, I don't have it with me, of course, um, that is a uh, Estonian lace piece, and it's one that they had kind of hinted at an issue before, they had photos of it, but they didn't say anything about the pattern or anything, and I loved it, and I did some research, and I found the stitch, and was very excited about it, thinking, oh, you know, I can mock this up, I can do this, and then this issue, they actually published the pattern so now I have no excuses and I yeah I've got excuses I get a lot of other things I need to work on so I'm, I'm being romanced and lured by the idea of this pattern because why not um I have been knitting I get a lot of knitting done uh on my blanket this week which is exciting and uh, let me get to a point where I can show you here so I talk to you guys all the time about my how to eat an elephant blanket, and it's here with me and dropping little nubs of yarn. Um, I needed to finish just a couple squares. I think I was two squares behind last time I saw you guys. Let's orient here and figure out where I was. Oh, yep, here we go. So here's where I was. I needed to do this square. I think I had just barely started it this one and then this row here to complete for the week to hit my goal and I did that obviously this is square 260 if I stick to goal I need to do four more squares this way before I'm at the side of the blanket I'm at the end of my column so that means I need to start another column and it is um see if I can orient myself again. This is all folded up. I actually got so far ahead this week on this. I've got four squares done and a fifth square started. So I am actually a week and a third ahead right now, which is super cool. Super cool. I don't want to completely just say, oh, hey, I'm ahead and I can skip a week. What I really want is to say, oh, hey, I'm ahead. And I don't have to really make this the only focus of my world this week. I can focus on other things. And that way, if I'm completely exhausted from work, I don't come home and sit on the sofa staring numbly and feel guilty about not making progress. Because, yes, I do feel guilty about not making progress. Thank you, Leanne. Hi, Wayne. I didn't see you pop on. Um, I, I love this so much. I'm so proud of how big it's gotten of the colors in it. I'm not proud of this. This is scary. <laughs> I have a lot of ends on the back end and I have not really determined how I'm going to handle that. I may just tie knots and put a backing on this. That's that's a very strong consideration. But I've got probably three years before I need to worry about that. So we're gonna see how it goes in the meantime. It's gotten really big. It's really beautiful. The colors on this camera are so very different than the colors on my other camera. But it's it's really making good progress and it's so cozy to sit under when I'm working on it now, which is just a delight. I'm trying very hard to keep this organized because I don't always unfold the whole thing when I work on it. I try to keep it kind of rolled up. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it clean. I have dogs. I have two dogs who insist upon being in my lap and being a part of my life. And I try to honor that for them as much as possible. And I have reality about that. I recognize that this will eventually be completely covered in dog hair. But until that day, it's going to stay as clean as possible. Hi, Marie. Thank you. So that's where I'm at with that. I have made good progress on that. I'm ahead on that. 
And that kind of gives me a little bit of breathing space for the next week and all the change that I'm going to go through. I did some work on, I did some crochet. I did one, one row. It's really sad. This is not that project, though. I did one row of crochet on my, um, I'm going to find it, my Through the Clouds shawl. This pattern is by Rachie Mueller. And I, I have thrown her color blocking to the wind, absolutely. And I'm just working on it in whatever color I'm more inspired to, whichever row I want to do next, and letting the colors just speak to me and become their own thing. I love this. I am so happy with the colors. This camera or this screen is not picking it up the way it's and beautiful, and they really just kind of wash out on this screen. There is a very, very pale coral in here. There is a um, cream with lots of different flecks. There's a burnt orange that has a full range of oranges in it. And then there's a purple that is both red and blue purple that is just gorgeous. I love this color. They're all really, really pretty. I am so happy with this, so happy with this. Um, this really just lives next to the TV for me. And whenever I'm not working on my blanket, or if I'm just tired, um, I'll pick this up and I'll try and get a row in. I got one row in the other night. And I really want this to make more progress faster, but it, I keep forgetting about it, to be perfectly honest, because it's sitting kind of out of the way. It's out of my line of sight. I moved a whole bunch of stuff around to make room for plants and my knitting kind of knitting and crafting crochet kind of got set aside and it's more a second fiddle in the living room rather than taking predominant space anymore. But that is coming. That's coming. I started a new project this week. I had shown you guys pictures of the shift. It's a cowl by, I'm going to get this wrong. Andrea Mowry. Um, I made one that I gave to my sister for Christmas. I loved it. It was so beautiful, but the colors were so her. And I decided so I started one. I showed you guys the yarn last episode last week. It is by Lolo Did It. It is her simple DK um, in Whisperers, Brother, and Call Me Debbie colorways. I've got this cast on, and I'm making really good progress on it, and I am so in love with the colors. They are just so beautiful. Andrea has this really neat texture stitch that she's doing. It does have color changes in it, but you are only ever working one color at a time. This is the back of the work, and it's accomplished through sit slip stitches. It starts at the top center back of the cowl and it's a bandana shape so you're working in the diagonal around down the length of the seam in the back before it comes down and does the triangle in the front and i have accomplished the height of the center back seam here and it's just turned here to start doing the diagonal to the front of the bandana front and i am I, I just can't say enough about how happy I am with these colors. They all work so beautifully together. Again, this yarn is Lolo Did It in the DK weight. I showed you the skeins. I'll show you the capes now because they're just gorgeous. This is Whispers. It is brown, kind of a um, barnwood brown. And it has flecks of orange and teal in it. Very, very pretty. This is Brother. Brother is a cream. Again, it has the orange, the teal, and it has brown flecks in it. It's like these were made to work together. And then this is Call Me Getty, and it's teal, and it has the orange and some brown. It's got some yellow in it and a little bit of red in it. It's the wilder of them, but they all work together, and I think they are just stunning together. 
catch up with my notes here. Oh, my dogs have their nails are trimmed so tight and they, they're super careful around nits. I've actually, they're actually really, really trained around nits. So I'm not too worried about them snagging the blanket so much as them uh, actually really is a chewer. I'm more concerned about that, but don't worry about that. By the time it's done, who knows? Um, let's see. It is going to be really cozy. It's nice and thick and because because you're doing all these color changes, it's almost double thick. It has this beautiful eye cord trim on it, all around on all sides. It's really, really lovely. I love the cowl. I, I this was introduced to me when I was at Unwound in La Crosse, Wisconsin, this past fall. I had it was totally off my radar. I hadn't seen it. I don't even really recall if somebody had one there. I think somebody had one there. And that's what turned me on to it. And I decided I really needed to try this just because I love the color interaction. I love the stitch. Super, super simple, really lovely. So this, this was the majority of what I did this week, obviously. And it's amazing how quick you gain progress on it when you start with four stitches. <laughs> I did cast this on, I think, I think I ended up casting on it five times. I just was not getting the gist of it initially. I don't know why not. I've made one before. That's what it was. Janet made one. It was so beautiful. She she is like uh, my friend Janet. She is the one that lures me into all these projects. She makes beautiful, beautiful projects, often with my yarns. She's the reason that I ended up doing the Through the Clouds shawl, too. So that's what I've been working on. That's what I've been knitting. That's what I've been crocheting. Um, I got my jeans cowl done. I talked to you guys about that last week. I just blocked it. I just laid it out to block this afternoon. If you're on Instagram, you would have seen a picture of it all pinned out. It's lovely. I just need it to dry so I can wear it. And then I need the temperatures to come back down out in the 50s again <laughs> so that I can wear it. Um, all of a sudden, it got warm. I don't look like it's warm right now. It's chilly in my studio, but the temperature is actually quite nice outside. Let's see what else is going on. Oh, we're going to do a knit along. We're going to do a knit along. So I've been talking to you guys. Wayne is going to tell me it's been two years probably um, about the squircle socks for a long, long time, and it became this overwhelming oppression for me to try and do the tutorial. I have three pairs of socks, all six of them are cast on and in various stages of knit for the squircle sock tutorial. Um, getting it all boarded, getting it all storyboarded out to figure out how to do the tutorial and have everything pre-staged so that I could sit down and film it in one shot. And does no one take one sitting what was becoming like this crazy overwhelming thing. And I had tried to storyboard it and that got set aside somewhere and God knows where those storyboards went um, as it's been like two years. The, the answer is we need to do this together. We need to do this as a team. The reason that I was trying to do it as one shot is because it really bothers me when I can't do it with contingency start to end, when I overlap or I misspeak, if it gets too broken up, I'm going to miss something. Whereas if I do it in a single shot, I'm not going to miss anything. If I do it with you, if we're all holding hands, then you can ask questions and I'm not going to miss anything, theoretically. So we're going to do a knit along instead. And I'm feeling much better about this. I'm a lot less pressured about this. And I feel like we're going to accomplish something together as well as it's going to add the interactive aspect to it where you don't watch a video and then have this pressure to knit a whole sock at once where you have the ability to contact me and work with me as we're doing this and we can do it together and you can ask questions in a timely manner. 
of course, if we're going to do a knit along, we should do a giveaway at the same time. And everyone who participates and can complete a sock in the time frame should be able to, you know, be in a drawing to get a prize, right? I think that's cool. So we're going to kick this off. Um, we are actually going to make next weekend the cast on party. The cast on party is going to have a couple of extra elements to it. Number one, that gives you time to procure your yarn, your needles, and download the pattern. It is a free pattern. It is available through Ravelry, but you do not need to be enrolled, logged in, a member of Ravelry to get it. The website is going to be listed below in the notes. It's going to be listed in all my stuff when we're done. You're also going to have the opportunity to see a couple of different cast-ons. Ha-ha! <laughs> So that you can choose which cast on you want to do if it's new to you. Learn a different cast on or determine which cast on you absolutely don't want to do. That's going to give more tutorial, more opportunities as well. So let's see. Wayne's yarn is coming in. Hey, all right. From Denver today, he's ready to go. Self-striping. That's important. So the beauty of the sparkle sock is that it makes gorgeous, gorgeous use of self-striping yarns. In that, General Hogbucker, I love that name, has taken a tube with a round pattern that allows for the stripes to happen down the leg. And then, through ingenious math, has made a square so that the stripes continue in slightly narrower blocks around the gusset area where your foot is thicker, where the work is thicker, without it skewing too much and losing that stitch pattern. And then from that square, it goes back into a circle again. So you get all this really gorgeous striping. And it's just, it's genius. It's really, really genius. Never mind that it actually is a better fitting heel. It's a better fitting ankle because it is doing different math there and it's accepting that the diagonal of your foot is bigger around than your forefoot or your leg. You like my leg and my forefoot? You know what we're talking about here. Felicity is a, Felicity, Felici is a gorgeous, gorgeous choice. You're gonna love that, Wayne. Um, let's see. <laughs> Terry, of course you are, and I bet they match. No, they don't match, do they? Oh, I'm sorry to hear she's not dying anymore, Leanne. Thank you for letting me know. I'll have to dig around and see if I have any more of her stuff. Sorry, I'm like trying to read the side of my screen here. Thank you, guys. Um, so I'm going to actually be jumping around because I have all these different <laughs> socks. I'm going to cast on with you guys, but I'm still going to be jumping along. I'm going to break this up into a bunch of different sections here so that you quite honestly are going to have like a month to complete one sock because let's face it, we all have real lives and this is not the only thing that we do in our days, though we wish it were. So the goal is we're going to cast on next Sunday, February 2nd. I'm not sure yet whether or not we're going to do that as a live. I think I'm probably not going to do that as a live so that I can demonstrate a couple of different cast-ons just because trying to demonstrate a cast-on without changing perspective with cameras is super difficult. The following week, we will have knit the cast-on, the ribbing, and the leg. We're going to be down through the leg and ready to start the heel um, so that we can talk about the garter band on the heel picking up stitches and what we're what we need to be looking at. The next week we're going to do the gusset. That's a big span between we may incorporate part of the gusset in that time because otherwise you're just going to need a tiny little ribbon and be done. Um, then we're going to move on to the foot and the toe and we are going to plan to have the toe done for Sunday, March 1st. Really that's one, two, three, four. We're looking at four weeks here, four or five weeks. Then we're going to do the drawing Sunday, March 8th. 
lots of time span, lots of wiggle room here so that we can get one sock done. That's the only requirement. If you are retired and have no life, as Wayne, you have a lovely life, stop it. Um, and you can get the whole pair done, groovy. If you can only get one sock done in that time, perfect. That's the only requirement for the drawing. What we're gonna have you do is post Instagram with a tagline, and we're gonna have you email, if you don't use Instagram, over to me so that I can keep a running spreadsheet of everybody that finished one sock, and we're gonna do a drawing from there. If you are looking at this and you're going, hmm, I'm not so sure I wanna do this, and then you go, wait, wait, I wanna drop in, great, as long as we have a picture of a sock before the eighth, that's all that's gonna matter. Oh, Leanne, one sock, one sock. It doesn't even have to have a long leg on it. You can do this, I promise you. It could be a sock for a little person. It doesn't even have to be a full-size sock. Anybody can knit a sock. Four or five weeks, you can do this, you can do this. So my goal, of course, is to get more than one sock done as I have literally six of them passed on and in various stages of complete. Um, that will also give me flexibility if real life happens to still be at a stage where I can show you what's going on. If you've never knit a sock before, fine, that's okay, we can do this together. Um, if you have knit socks before and you're a whiz at it, join us, come along for the ride. Um, I am going to be talking at some distinct points in this about alternate on numbers and the math to do the heel and the gusset for that. General Hogbuffer has designed this not as a pattern so much as a formula. So there's wiggle room here. The pattern is generally written for a 64 stitch cast on that's using fingering weight yarn um, at eight stitches per inch, which is a pretty standard gauge and size for socks. I have one of them passed on, I think. It's in either a DK or a worsted weight, and I believe, if memory serves, it's a 56 stitch cast on multiple to four folks. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the math behind that to do alternates. If you want to work with a thicker yarn, fine, cast on with a thicker yarn. Make sure it's a nice, durable fabric that you're making. A small swatch will tell you, and make sure that it is cast on in a multiple of four. Ruby, we're good to go. Will I break them down? Um, it is possible uh, that when this is all done, because I will still have all the raw footage, that I can pull this together as a full Sparkle tutorial with chapters. Um, I don't know that I'm going to break them down into individual pieces where it's like a cast on video and then a leg or heel video, um, so much as that's just going to be what our flow is but I will keep all the raw footage together and see if I can't make one complete tutorial rather than having people have to jump. Um, I should be able to put timestamp references in there so that if you did want to go back and look specifically at the map or if you specifically wanted to look at like the Kitchener toe, we could easily do that. Um, if I'm really up on my game, I will be able to offer you multiple toes as well. Um, I will see. <laughs> we'll see. We are going to do this. Um, the squircle is a top down sock. That's important to note as well. I have done both top down and toe up socks. I actually prefer a top down sock. That's me. I have a stretchy, stretchy cast on that I like to use, and I'm not great with a stretch bind off without getting like lettuce leaves at the top. So although I love doing a toe cast on, I'm not thrilled with my bind off even now, many, many socks into this. Um, I'm gonna be showing a couple of different stretchy casts on. I will be showing the long tail cast on, which I, I love that one. It's, it's nice, it's easy, it's my go-to for many, many projects. However, I'm gonna be showing you the Chinese waitress cast on and it's my modified version of it that I think is actually slightly easier. Um, it makes use of a double-pointed needle. And instead of taking the needle out 
of the loop and reinserting it to come in a different direction, I'm just swinging it around. Um, I have got a tutorial already up showing that somewhere on the YouTubes. I'm not sure if it's in an actual episode or if I have it as a standalone, but I'm going to be showing that again, absolutely. Um, it, it's a little bit fiddly. It's a little bit slow, but I love it. It's worth it. <laughs> yeah, um, ribbing can be tedious. I think one or two of my socks, because one of them is um, not in a self-striping yarn. It, it's in a long color change yarn, I think. I think I ribbed the entire leg on it. Um, which, if I've done that with one, means I get to do it with two. Mm. <laughs> Not so thrilled about that. Um, I, I do like a ripped leg often, so I, I hear you, Wayne. I know. Lot of ribbing is not fun. I think the um, part that I like least about socks is the gusset. It seems to go on forever. But once the gusset's done, then I'm onto the foot. The the leg, sometimes the leg is long. I, I don't know. I've got big feet. I've got big feet. So it seems like it takes forever either way. I think toe up always feels like they go faster for me. Because once the toe is done, then I'm so concerned about not overshooting before I start the gusset that I feel like the foot gets done very, very quickly. Um, when I do toe up, I do a reverse French heel. So I'm still doing a heel flap heel. Um, it, it's really my go-to. It's my preferred. Hey, Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Is it raining? Is it snowing? Are the sheep all wet? I can't believe you're going to have to shear in that weather. Um, the, the heel flap is a good fit on me, and that's part of why the squircle socks were so enticing to me was because they are ultimately a heel flap sock. I've tried to do a rounded heel. I've tried to do a short roll heel. I think I tried an um, afterthought heel once, and it fits so badly I tore the whole thing back out. Um, the sweet tomato heel I've never tried. The fish lips kiss heel I've never tried. Just because I know if I do it as it's written and I don't modify it, it's not going to fit. I just straight up have a very high instep. And I have to, it, it only makes sense to knit socks that fit you, right? Oh, sorry, that was there. So I'm very, very excited about this. I can't wait to do this knit along with you guys. I'm excited that you're still excited. I'm sorry that it took so long. Um, it is what it is, and we're going to go forward. We're going to have a prize. We're going to have a prize. I've alluded to that. There's going to be yarn, of course. There's going to be a project bag, of course. I have a project bag that was given to me by Erica to do in a giveaway a long, long time ago. And it is so cute. I'm going to, I'm going to show you guys. I have had this in my prize store for so long. It's got monkeys. Aren't they cute? I just love this. It's got a removable wrist strap on. It has her tag on it, Oak Street Fibers. Hopefully that's not a mirror. It's a mirror for me. I don't know if it's a mirror for you. It is a drawstring top. And it has a nice little pocket inside. There it is. With more monkeys. <laughs> and the bottom is actually gusseted. So it's a square bottom. I love this. I think the fabric is super adorable. I, you know, I got to thank the monkeys. Um, this is actually going to be part of the giveaway prize for the Squirkle Knit Along. So, come on, guys, cast it on. You're going to have fun. Isn't that cute? You guys, thank you. Erica, if you're out there, thank you again for sponsoring this, for sewing this up for me, for allowing me to keep this in the prize stores for so long. <laughs> Terry just threw down the gauntlet. She's going to win this. Um, I got to be careful about saying that because it seems like every time I go, oh, so and so is going to win this. Their name's the name that gets drawn. Wayne is like the king of that. Wayne, how many prizes have you won? How many 
drawings that he won. A lot of the bags are just too feminine. I agree. Um, some of the bags that I have, I, I knit at work. I knit at work. And although I'm pretty comfortable in being the only knitter in my office, um, or at least the only knitter that knits publicly, I'm a little bit shy about carrying some of my bags around. Um, I've got a couple bags that are really funky designs. And I have some that just don't go out into public. I think the one that people ask me about the most is my Star Trek bag. The one that I put my sweaters in. It's got um, vintage cartoon Star Trek uh, vignettes on it. And inevitably somebody goes, that's a weird handbag. Because <laughs> it's not a handbag. <laughs> it's not a handbag. Four or five, yeah, Wayne, you have been the big winner all along. <laughs> Katie, you need like a giant fan. <laughs> Just blow dry all the sheep. Do they get fluffy if they get blown dry? Are they all like all poofed out like they just left the beauty salon? You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for communicating. Thank you so much for participating in the chat. Um, that means a lot to me. These are very, very difficult to do. When I sit here and I do my podcast, I often feel like I am speaking to myself kind of in a diary format. I know that you're there because you comment to me later on when you're watching. Um, often I'll end up in chats with you guys when you're watching where you'll be like, oh, this part just came up. Ha ha ha. Um, but when I'm actually filming it, sometimes it is this insurmountable, why am I talking about this? And who does this matter to? And does it matter enough to me that I want to bother to put it on film? So actually interacting with you guys and seeing that, yeah, you're interested in doing the, the knit along, that you like the prize. Thank you. That means a lot. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> he is, uh, Leanne, you're funny. Uh, Wayne is the master of the multi-entry. If there are multiple ways to enter, he is there and he hits every one of them. And I have had spreadsheets where I had entries listed where I would have blocks of Wayne <laughs> where Wayne shared and Wayne shared and Wayne posted. And uh, um, He is the master of multi-entry. <laughs> um, when you imply that purchase is necessary to enter. <laughs> thank you, Marie. That that means a lot. That really does. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough for the support, for the interaction, for the emails, for the messages, for the time you guys spend, for the purchases you make. Um, you make all this why I do it and what I want to do. Thank you, Wayne. Um, yeah, so what else is going on? Cast on party next Sunday. We're going to have the tutorials there and I'm going to have the link set up so you guys can all download the pattern. If you're really struggling with the pattern, if you're not able to find it, if you aren't comfortable downloading it, message me and I'll make sure it gets emailed over to you. Um, I can trigger that through the system so it emails the download file to you. And... Get your yarn ready. Get your needles ready. If you've never done socks before, really what we're looking for in a fingering weight is eight stitches to an inch. It's kind of dense. It's a sock. It's going to relax, it's, especially if it's a super wash. It's going to relax a lot. Um, that is average. Uh, it Your knitting will stick to the needle. Um, I use a U.S. size 2 needle when I do it. Some people go down to a one and a half. Often one is the right size for many, many knitters. I've known people that have gone down to double aughts to get that gauge just because they are such loose, loose knitters. If you want to go with a bigger needle, uh, message me. If you're talking about trying to do this with a worsted weight, message me and we'll talk about needle size and gauge to get that. 
ultimately what you want to do is have a cast on count for how many ever stitches you have to do an eight inch circle with a dense fabric. Wow, double odds. Holy crap, lady. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to see the needle. I'm <laughs> looking for the wire. Um, and yes, I will custom dye yarn for people. Absolutely, I love to do custom dyes. Double aughts. I don't even own double aughts. I have, I think the smallest needle I have, I'm going to look. I have some ones. I have some ones, and they are pretty tragically bent because they are that flexible. And they are just cheapo aluminum needles. But these are looking like Home Depot 2x4s. They are pretty. Bench. That one has a straight up turn in it where it's see if I can use how much that one is bailing on me. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, hockey sticks. And they're dinged really bad too. They I must have thrown these on the floor quite a bit. <laughs> Just why are you playing with this? So I, I told you all that I have got six of these socks cast on already. I told you that I used US2. This is the other collection of US2 DPMs I have. And these are not projects spoken for right now. Those are my aluminum ones. I also have an entire collection of, come on. Six inch Haya Haya's and Haya Haya's and nine inch circulars. And then I have some other US ones. I have one other set of US ones. I have got sock needles everywhere. Um, these are just the double pointed needles and I've got one of the nine inches here. Um, I think this nine inch is a US one as well. Sort myself out here. Oh good, the sizing's gone on it. I love that. It'll be marked. I need to remark it and get it put away. Obviously, I don't have all my needles put away right now. Um, but I also have a long circular, um, I think both a US 1 and a US 2. I know for sure I have the two. I may have a one, one or a one and a half. I was trying to go down a size because I was noticing that my gauge had loosened up um, in really, really long where the squircle socks will end up with a very high stitch count when we get to the gusset. Just because you're going all the way around the heel and the front of the foot. Um, with double pointed needles, it works very nicely. You have a lot of stitches on a couple needles at one point. You're reducing from that point so it gets smaller and smaller as you go. With the nine inch circulars, it became a real challenge. I ended up with too many stitches on the needle to function. And I ended up going to a really, really long needle and doing it almost magic loop. That worked out better for me. I also use the really long needle when I'm working them Portuguese knitting. I think one of the pairs that I'm working on, I'm actually knitting it inside out. So I'm curling it to make use of the Portuguese knitting. I prefer when I use the Portuguese technique to do them inside out so that I can really make use of how simple it is to purl because I'm literally just flicking a thumb to purl stitches. I haven't done that in a long, long time because my shoulder has been very, very healthy. I haven't worried about that. <laughs> yes, you can absolutely magic loop these. Absolutely. Um, I, when I first learned about magic loop, I really struggled with the concept of that. The reality is you define your, your needle changes if you are used to working on double points or if you're used to working with two circulars at the same time, you define your needle change by where you're looping out the excess needle on your circular needle. 
that decomplicated it significantly for me and made it much, much easier. Um, I still have a tendency to get a little bit of laddering. It's really all about how flexible your cable is to avoid that and knowing to tighten your gauge two before and two after to even out that laddering and then massage your work to the tub so that it takes up that loose ladder there. Um, really, no matter what technique you're comfortable with, other than straight needles, you can accomplish this absolutely no matter which technique. I, I had to do that too, um, Katie. I did top and bottom, but it was insane because you have the six on the on the bottom and you've got you know seventy something on the top. And I did left right as well. That worked very well for me when I played with it with two circular needles. I think I have knit these socks every way possible. Um, I've done it with double pointed needles. I have done it with magic loop with one really long needle. I've lost a needle that way. I left it in, in the garden at the hospital. I, I must have finished using it and gone back to a nine inch. Um, I do the nine inch circulars. I do two of them at once. I employ different techniques and I am not married to any one of them. I'm very much about using the right tool for the job. Yes, everything becomes a nail if the only tool you have is a hammer, um, but I bounce around. So I will go from double pointed needles over to a circular needle, back on to a long needle. I, I change up and to use whatever I'm comfortable with at that time. Um, it keeps me active. It keeps my techniques and skills up. Um, I, I'm very, very flexible with them. So that gives me the ability to talk about all of them theoretically. That doesn't mean what I tell you is going to be right for you. Do what works for you. Circular needles, the nine inch circulars, um, when I first started working with them, they were a challenge. Part of it was I have a tendency to push with my uh, little finger. I use that as part of my tensioning and needle advancing. And where the nine inch circulars are so short in their points, I was missing that. I wasn't able to advance the needle with that finger. Um, that bothered me and it put a lot of pressure further up onto the inner digits. I also had trouble with gripping all that. I got big gummy hands and fingers, and there was a lot to hold on to and not enough to actually grip. Um, I adapted, I get used to it over time. Like anything, you build muscle memory, you get used to it with more and more use. Um, one of the things that I found with the nine inch circuits was that, let's see if this one's a pair that does it. Some of them are straight. This is a straight set. And some of them are, actually I have two sets in here. These are straight, straight, straight. It's quite literally a very, very short straight needle with a flexi bit. Others have an angle in them, right at the short throw here. And I like those better. It brings it around and it gives me a lot more flexibility. Whereas this, I feel like I'm already straining the joints just to bring the tips together. Um, there, there's a lot of pressure happening right here with the bent ones that doesn't happen so much and I got the bent ones quite by accident I was actually pretty annoyed when they showed up because the picture I had purchased them from showed them straight and when they arrived they were angled uh, miffed doesn't begin to cover it I hate when I purchase something and what arrives is not what I purchased. Um, but as soon as I used them, I was like, oh, hey, happy accident. Okay, I like that. I'm going to catch up real quick here with notes. Katie, I totally get that. A lot of my holding is not with my fingertips. Um, Stephanie Pearl McPhee did a really interesting um, essay talking about the number of muscles and how if she watches somebody knit, we all accomplish the same thing. We all advance 
the needle, we all wrap, we all draw through. But when you look at the minutia, when you really look at every single muscle and every little thing that's happening when you knit, every single one of us knits extremely, extremely differently. And I, you know, like I said, I advance here with my little finger. Other people advance only with the tips of their fingers. Every one of us does it different. And it's so fascinating, that it's like our handwriting, that it's like our voices, that it's so signature to the individual. The bent ones really are better, Leanne. I, I really like them so much better. Team man hands, right? Ah, you make me laugh. I, yeah, yarn overs and pearls at the end of a needle. Um, I, I hate patterns. Boy, hate's a strong word. I hate stitch repeats and stitch patterns that begin with a pearl. Um, when I work my patterns or when I work my socks, especially if I'm on BPMs, I'll advance the beginning of the round or, or even fall back the beginning of the round to make sure that I end with a pearl and I begin with a knit. Uh, especially if I'm doing ribbing, I just hate starting out with a pearl. It's my own personal yuck. Um, I am fascinated by patterns that will change the starting row will we'll change the beginning of a round to avoid doing a yarn over at the beginning. I'm not sure why that one is such a challenge to, to wrap the needle and then make the next stitch um, without having to change the beginning of the round and patterns that will change the beginning of the round and then change it back the very next round just to avoid a yarn over at the beginning. Get under my skin. Yeah, shift it, start with a knit. It's it's, it's happy. <laughs> I don't know why I don't like to start with a pearl. It's so weird, Jen. Let's see, what else do we have to discuss today? Does anybody have any questions for me? I'm hanging. Silence. I love that. <laughs> Either that or somebody's typing something really scary. I'm not sure which. I had to get like five all at once. I'm really be terrified. Snowy forecast. Nope. No, no snowy forecast right now. If you're talking about the this, that is in the works. Um, I have a shawl pattern, a three-quarter square shawl pattern that I have not released. You guys have seen it sitting on the back of my chair forever. Um, I have, I requested some time off. Hmm. I'm very excited about that. And that is actually on my wish list of things to work on during my time off. Some of us are How's the shop? Is it a good day there today? I'm not going to do it live, Marie. Have dinner. Have a wonderful time. It will be my regular episode, and it will be just the cast-on kickoff of the Knit Along. I want to be able to film the, the different cast-ons in a way that you guys can really see, and that's very difficult to do live. Um, there's going to be a lot of editing to make sure you guys can see what I'm actually doing. So there won't be a specific time next week, but we will be live again in the future. And I'll have my time zones correct. I promise I will have a third party edit that mess before I publish. Um, have dinner with the kids. Have a great time. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, snowy forecast. Um, I'm not really sure. The, the name on this thing has changed like five times. And I, I think that's why I tripped up when you asked about Snowy Forecast, because that was one of the names. I'm not quite sure where it landed. I have to check my notes again. Come here, little guy. I'll set you aside for a second. 
get y'all caught back up up here. Say. One of my concerns with this is that the remaining yardage is extremely tight and doesn't necessarily give me room to provide you with a 10% overage in my estimate to make up for gauge. Um, but if you used any yarn other than this yarn, the yardage would be different. This yardage happens to be very, very strict yardage. It's a 400 yard skein. I love this piece. It's beautiful. It's simple. It's a single color piece rather than striped like the other ones. Um, it is the three quarter square again with the square neck hole. I simply haven't published it yet. And part of it is just straight up nerves about making sure that the yardage is something that anybody can accomplish and not feel like they have to buy a another whole skein and end up with 99% of that skein left over. Um, I try to make my patterns very convenient. And that sounds kind of strange, probably. But I want the majority to be able to accomplish it readily and easily without a ton of leftover yarn. Um, I, I've had people approach me in the past and say, you have too much leftover or this was so tight, it was nerve wracking. Um, Marie, have a great time. Thank you so much. Love you very much. We'll talk to you later. Um, I, I don't like doing that to people. I like it to use as much yardage as possible without a ton of leftover, but not with a harrowing <laughs> yarn chicken at the end. Nobody enjoys that. That's not fun, and that's it's not fair either. I, I You guys have heard me talk about sweaters in the past that I always get very, very nervous if I don't have a full skein of yarn for each of the sleeves. And yet, inevitably, sleeves don't take that much yarn. Um, I have been shorted so many times with patterns that had typos for yardage or that were poorly calculated or were exactly what that person used for yardage and did not have that buffer edited in. Whenever you purchase any of my patterns, whenever you work any of my patterns, there is always a 10% buffer loaded to that percentage to that yardage estimate so if I say that it was how do I express this to you guys if I say it takes 300 yards I will publish that it takes 330 yards so that you have that excess built in and you have 330 yards in place so that if it if your particular personal gauge uses more you're not caught or <laughs> right? Um, gauge is important. Gauge is what saves us from that happening. So, uh, quite literally, let's see if this is it still up here. I'm reaching. It was here. What did I do with it? I've set it aside someplace. Is it in there? It's not in there. I have the leftover remnants of this. It is. Oh, there it is. It's on my shelf. Yeah. That's what's left from working this. That little bit right there. That bothers me. That that is my concern. And where this is the recommended yarn for this pattern, I need to reevaluate if I'm going to publish it and suggest extra yardage, or if I'm going to re-knit this with a different base and use that yardage as the goal. Or third option. I re-knit this and adjust it slightly to use less yardage. And by that, I mean that I would change out the overall pattern to probably remove even just one row out of this. That would give us that extra yardage to make this work. These are considerations that I go into. Um, and I agree, Leanne, absolutely. Gauge is extremely personal. Although this is the fabric that you see and that you get the pattern for, you may cast this on and go, I like this loosier. I like it drapier. 
or I like this much firmer, or I want to do this at a totally different gauge, and I want to go up and make this this great big serape. Um, that that throws that yardage, and it's yours. It's yours. The beauty of knitting, the beauty of design, is that it's a jumping off point. It's really something that you can wholly personalize and make completely your own. And I, as an early knitter, I started with patterns that were very fit oriented. And I didn't particularly like the fabrics. I didn't particularly like the fit. And it wasn't until I discovered lace. It wasn't until I did my first shawl. And, and I remember casting on my first triangular shawl and having a Carter stitch tab cast on and going back to friends on Ravelry and Group and being like, what is this witchcraft? How does this thing work? There's no diagram. I'm supposed to do this and firm this and do this. And whoa. And they just said, trust the pattern, go with it. Um, but as soon as I did that, as soon as I did that for a shawl, I threw gauge out. That was it. I did not care about gauge any longer. And it has taken me a whole long journey to come back to a point where I'm making gauge matter again. I'm making sweaters. I'm making garments that have to fit. I'm designing hat patterns again. Hat patterns, gauge kind of matters. Um, I've shown you guys my, my giant glove hat. If you're not familiar with that, please reference back to old videos where I put the hat on and it falls down to my neck. Um, gauge matters. Gauge is important. And at the same time, it is very personal. And you should make it what you want it to be. Absolutely. So this this is coming. This is we're gonna do this. I love this. I have not unfolded this and actually looked at this pattern in a long time, and it really is very pretty. I like this little detail I put in here. It spent so long I don't even remember. Gosh, that's scary. I hope I can find my notes and my pattern for this and my charts. It may take most of the time I took off to get this all pulled together. But I do want to get that released yeah, definitely by fall. And um, after the sock, maybe we'll do another knit along and we'll do that piece. That would be fun to do. I think I would like to do that again in a much larger gauge. I'd like to actually ramp up and probably do that in like a worsted weight um, and make it just really, really huge for really cold weather. And um, I, although I'm looking at patterns to do like a hooded cowl, I am really tempted to kind of wing it and make one myself. Um, the patterns that I'm finding have a tendency to be kind of fitted. And I don't want that. I really want something just massive and drapey and loose. Although I design a lot of hats and I have knit a million hats, I have stacks of hats here. Um, I am not a hat wearer unless it's really, really brutal. I have very, very fine hair. And anything that touches my hair immediately turns me into a fuzzy bird. And that is not the most professional look for the corporate office. Um, so I, I have a tendency instead to be kind of cold and wear a lot of cowls and scarves and pull them very high, but I'm thinking if I have a very loose, drapey, hooded cowl style, I can pull that up and it won't be as confined and tight and won't make me quite as fuzzy. We'll see. We'll see. It, isn't that bizarre, Katie? The difference between gauge and density um, it has so much to do, of course, with the, the girth of the, the fiber itself, but just changing this, I can use this fingering and I can use another fingering of the same weight and its own fluff. The, the difference of a halo can change the density of it. The difference of uh, just how many um, ply it is, it, it can be exactly the same, but the plies will change that up and behave very differently. I, I actively change up my monkey every episode. Um, 
I, I believe very strongly in the rules of Muppets that uh, stuffed animals live, that they have a life and spirit of their own. Um, my monkey has great character. I adore him. Uh, Terry actually made him for me. You guys see her as Squ Squirrel Girl 66 on here. She knit him for me, and he is made completely of my own yarns. He is made from my DK weights. Um, every one of them has a completely different face and a different personality. She's got, Terry, what have you got? Three more of them at the shop. Terry works uh, up at Unwound, and um, she has them when I, when I go up. She always has a surprise for me. They're in the window, and they're holding my yarn, or they're hanging from someplace. Um, I, I just absolutely fell in love with them the very first time I went up there and saw the monkey in the window. That was, that was everything. That was the best, showing up there and having a monkey hanging out in the window. So I, I asked her to make the monkey for me. She surprised me, and she made him a emotional support chicken that is pure. Uh, he, of course, is dye all over his fingers, just like my monkey logo um, and his, his little hat. He has his own Keiko hat. It's a uh, downsized version of my hat that Terry knit for him. I adore him. And the people that message me and comment about, oh, he looks sad today or, oh, he, he looks so snugly. Um, that that's fun. That's telling me that you're watching, and that's uh, very personal. I, I I really love that. As for this, yes, I have a good time. I um, <laughs> change up my hair all the time. I get bored very very easily, and I only have so many cuts that I can work with. So, like uh, all the other color that I add into my world, this is just one more thing that I can dye. I, I loved sending up the yarn for the monkey. That was so cool. I was very concerned about yardage. I wasn't sure quite what you needed. Um, I, Terry at one point contacted me and asked me if I wanted to see progress photos of him being made and his assembly. Um, I, I really appreciate surprises with stuff like that. So I opted not to see progress. However, in his construction there is the face construction actually works down toward the, the center point of his nose so at one point this area of his face was all on a circular needle and she sent me the most hilarious video of him shrieking and singing and I still have that video somewhere that mouth video was absolutely Absolutely hilarious. I've played that so many times because she could adjust the the cable to make his mouth shriek open or close that. It was so fun. Love that thing. I I am really moving to very warm weather stuff. I think I finally am just so tired of being not warm weather stuff, warmer stuff for cold weather. Um, like you, Leanne, I think I'm so tired of being cold at this point. This always happens when we're aiming for February. Um, this weather right now in the Southwest is very, very typical of January. We go through this thing for about two weeks in January where I can go outside and sit outside and have lunch in the garden and it's very enjoyable. And then February hits. And I think I've just finally gotten used to this. February hits and we can go sub-zero for the month. It can be bitter, horrible cold here um, in February and into March before we actually get on to spring. And then all of a sudden, bang, Mother's Day is here and everybody's gardens are in bloom. I think I'm in preparation. I think I know in my bones that it's about to get very, very cold again. And that's why all of a sudden I'm like, I need all my heavy gear back out. Um, in moving my, my day job office, that was hysterical. I opened up my filing cabinet. You know, who uses a filing cabinet these days? I have like a box of tea in there and I have a whole wellness center that has like cough drops and um, home remedies and, and weird 
medicinal pills. Like I, I randomly had motion sickness pills in there because I get very dizzy sometimes. I had like crazy, crazy stuff in this box all down in my filing cabinet. And then I had all my knitwear. wear. Uh, I found two cowls, a hat, a pair of fingerless gloves. I'm trying to think what else was in there. Uh, there were the two cowls, there was a hat, there were the fingerless gloves, and then there was another like lap shawl blanket thing that I've been using. And of course, none of that was going to fit in the moving tote. So I came home with this great big bag thrown over my shoulder, it was all puffed out. I could have been in a car accident where rescued me. I didn't even need airbags. This thing was so full of knitwear. When I get there tomorrow, uh, I'm a little freaked out because I'm going to need all of my all of my knits back with me from my office. Uh, New Mexico cold or Maine cold? That is an interesting question. The longer I'm here and and the more I discover that temperature is the same everywhere, it's humidity that is really the driving force. Um, I get as cold here as I get in Maine. And I get as cold here as I get in Wisconsin. The humidity is the real difference. And yes, we get cutting, raw, wet, cold, bitter here. Um, we do get sub-zero here. We do have deep freezes that will kill trees and yeah, any outdoor plants. Um, it just doesn't last as long. We, we visit it. We don't live in it. It's not like... Um, the, and the behavior down here is totally different. If it starts to rain, people can't drive. If it snows at all, people can't drive. In comparison, my statement, this is in comparison to Maine, where six inches, we don't cancel school. <laughs> Wisconsin, two and a half feet, we don't cancel school. Here, quarter of an inch, that's it, game over. We don't have plows, we don't salt, we don't sand. Um, it's really more about duration and humidity. It's weird. This, this is funny because I'm looking at the population of who's logged in right now. And we have a couple of people who are up in Maine. We have a couple of people in Wisconsin. Um, we have people in the deep south. We're talking New Mexico, the Mexican Caribbean, um, Alabama, and there's like nobody mid-country at all. <laughs> so everybody is really in extremes here. We have people that focus on socks, we have people that focus on sweaters. We have people here that focus on lighter uh, wear that's very temporary or they knit as gifts. Uh, um, at the same time, we have people that focus on shop samples and toys. We have people that focus on heavy winter wear where they'll have a sweater that will swallow them whole and <laughs> they'll want a hat that matches. Um, the one thing that we all have in common is we love yarn and we love what we make and what we do. Monkeys mismatch socks. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So Terry, my, my OCD gets just a little bit weird. Um, I don't, I, I like all my stuff to be matchy matchy and I'll strike my socks and make my socks line up. And if there's color changes or self-patterning, I'll make sure that it lines up. Like anything more than two rows out of sync makes me itch and makes me insane. Um, yeah, I know negative 13 for a week is crazy. We'll see it for like two days. Um, <coughs> pardon me. But my monkey has one foot that's much more purple than the other. <laughs> And I know he just stepped in ink, but he needs to even that out. He needs to splash around a little bit and make sure both feet are fully coated or washed up. One of the two. And me and my, me and my OCD. The matchy-matchy is very important. I don't know why. I'm trying to um, 
be more flexible in that. I'm trying to embrace imbalance and change and uh, mismatch and unique. And that's not in my making. <laughs> Silly things. I know it was my fault. Wayne, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to do this again soon. I'm actually going to wrap up here in the next couple of minutes as well. This will be like a regular podcast. You will be able to go and watch like all of the past podcasts. This one will be there as well. And I will be loading the uh, footnotes into this as well as the link off to that pattern. Wayne, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to see you and interact with you. <coughs> oh, this is fun. I love being able to interact with you guys and um, answer questions and have jumping off points. That's fun for me. And I will be looking to do this much more often. We'll try and schedule this. I, I ultimately think that I could get away with doing this once a month. It's really about um, time. And what time of day works best for you guys, what day of the week works best for you. I'm very confined by my day job, and this is not something that I can do um, in the evenings midweek. I'm really kind of stuck with weekends. Hopefully, like a Sunday afternoon evening works best for you guys. That is the most convenient time for me, but I am willing to shift and do like a Saturday morning if we think that that's going to work better for all of us. I know what you're talking about, Katie. Um, it, the temperature here vacillates very, very hard. We have a lot of extremes here where I may leave the house in the morning and it's 20 degrees. By noon, we get up to 40. By 4 o'clock, we could be at 60 degrees. And then come 7, 8 o'clock at night, we're back down into the 20s. The range is very extreme. And honestly, I wear a lot of fleece and I build up a all the static because I'm putting on and taking off and putting on and taking off. Um, couple that into my work environment where we have you know, central HVAC and we've got 280 people and everybody's walking over and hitting the thermostat in their preferred direction. Um, having the smaller pieces, especially neck pieces, I'm always astounded by how much of a difference in my personal body temperature just having something against my neck may. Um, really acclimating and constantly trying to keep my temperature balanced. I have to be very careful about wearing sweaters to work because I may go to work in a sweater and think, oh, I'll be comfortable. I'll be sweating one minute and frozen the next. And the constant, it's like some kind of workout putting on and taking off layers. It really is. You are in and out of the barn and you're chasing and feeding and corralling and I, I don't know how you keep up with all of it. I, yeah. I, it's um, very different labor, absolutely. Uh, but it reminds me a lot of skiing and teaching skiing in that you're out on the slopes, you're at the top of a mountain, there's one temperature, you come down to the bottom, it's a totally different temperature and you're active and you're moving in that process and then you're back on a lift and you're stagnant as you're going into a higher altitude and a lower temperature only to come back down again and maybe go inside and warm up. And the, the range of temperatures that your body experiences in that, you may see a full 20 degree spectrum in that process. You're very much in that same situation where you're out in the wind and the rain and you're dealing with animals or you're growling or you're building and then all of a sudden the next time you're there you're you're back in the barn and you're a little bit more sheltered or you're back in the house to grab something only to go back outside and cold again not having good insulated stuff stuff that insulates not only you should be like a thermos <laughs> you need to keep an internal climate and an external climate layers are the answer absolutely rachel is the master of layers um, she is a ski instructor, and she knows exactly what I'm talking about in dealing with that range. Um, Katie owns, lives on a farm, and she's raising sheep. 
Um, she's headed into shearing season very quickly, and the forecast has not been friendly. She's looking to be in cold and rain. Um, so we're talking about really soggy fiber and mud. And that's not a good time, Katie. I My fingers, toes, and nose are crossed for you that that weather shifts. And I hope you, <laughs> you have some good weather for that process. All right, guys, I am going to wrap it up. We're at an hour and 20, and that's kind of a long episode for anybody who wants to follow up later. Please send me a message, and I will see you guys all next Sunday. Thank you again for joining me. I really was very concerned that I'd be here alone today because of the time zone publication issue. And everybody who took the time to sit here and join me today and interact, it has been fun, and I really appreciate it and I hope you all are getting ready to cast on your socks. Thank you all so much. I will see you next time. Good to see you. Bye guys. Ah!